page 538 in the blue hardback Bibles, Psalm 19. Christian, hear the word of the Lord this morning to us in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward." Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Christian, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and keep your Bible open in front of you this whole time if you would. Well, as we go through the Psalms, I want to remind you that Psalms were originally songs. And uh, I'm going to do an experiment that I first heard of from Stanford University. I'm going to see if you can figure something out. Okay, I'm going to clap the melody of a song I'm not going to sing the song, but I want to know if you can catch the melody by my clapping. You ready? Anybody know what song I just clapped? Happy birthday to you. (laughs) Who didn't hear it? You're not alone. Um, It is a happy birthday because Katie, just in case, you know, this is a little in-house information. Katie and Ryan Erton are in the hospital right now, and it is going to be a happy birthday. Isn't that a great Father's Day gift? I'll give you another one. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. All right. I didn't come up with this stupid test. This was Stanford, okay? (laughs) What they found, though, is if I hear the melody in my head, my assumption is that you also can hear the melody. But if you don't hear the melody, all you hear is a series of claps. Uh, Friends, what I want to suggest to you this morning is Christianity works almost exactly the same way. You can be around Christians, you can be around the Bible, and it sounds like people are clapping, but you never quite get the melody. Uh, The people around you seem to know the melody. They seem to sing just fine, but you can't quite catch it. You don't hear the music behind the clapping. Or or think about it this way. If you like dancing, um, you'll know that a waltz is what? How many beats are there to a waltz? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And when you have to dance a waltz, it doesn't matter. The, the, the time signature can be 3 2, 3 4, or 3 8. And the way you catch the rhythm of the dance is as you listen to the music in the back of your mind, what you're hearing is 1 2 3, 1 2 3, 1 2. And that's how you learn to waltz. Uh, Christian, friend, do you hear the melody behind the clapping? Do you, do you catch the rhythm behind the music? Um, do you get Christianity? Does it make sense? Or does it, is it like a song you never catch the melody to? And a dance, everyone else seems to be dancing, and they can dance just fine, but I don't get the rhythm to it. It doesn't come easily for me. 
Have you ever asked yourself that or thought that? Uh, well, friends, what I want to suggest to you this morning uh, is that um, I can show you how to catch the rhythm and the melody. Um, you can learn to waltz. <laughs> and the reason I'm calling this psalm the waltzing psalm is because there's three steps to this psalm. Look right in front of you. It's easy. It's right there in front of you. The first step of catching the melody, the, the rhythm of the dance of God, is right there. You have to see God's world. Look at verse 1 through 6. That's the psalmist telling us about God's world. And then verses 7 through 11 in front of you, that's God revealing his word to us. And then lastly, in verses 12 through 14, we see God's grace. And that's the rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three. That's the melody behind all of the clapping we do as Christians. We've got to see the world that God has created. We've got to see his word as the truth itself. And we've got to see his grace. And friends, if you don't see those three things, uh, Christianity will never make sense to you. It'll be like a, a dance you never learn how to be a part of. It'll be like a song you never learn to sing. Uh, so friends, with that in mind, I want to show you how this works out. Look at verse 1. Let's start off. The first step, the one step, right? Step one of the dance, of the waltz of God, right there, is seeing God's world. We'll look at verse one, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And right there, there that's hearkening back to Genesis 1, right, that God has created this world. And part of the reason God created this world was to reveal his glory. And I know, like, we don't think about glory a whole lot. Um, you don't normally say glory um, I mean, Kanye West talks about glory, but he's not like most people, right? <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't use the word glory very much anymore, but remember, an easy definition of what glory means is just impressiveness. Now, I don't know if that's a word or not. Impressiveness is probably not an actual word, but it's the aspect of being impressive, of being wowed by something, right? And that's what verse 1 is saying. It's saying the heavens, you know, the stars, the heavens, you know, the Hashemayim in Hebrew, the stuff up in the sky, those things speak to us. And in Hebrew, when it says declare, it means it, it's continuing to declare. It has always been declaring the impressiveness, the awesomeness of God. And he, he echoes that again. He says, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. God is a creative God that has created a beautiful world. Right, in verse 2 and following, it explains it more and more, right? Day, at day to day, this pours out a speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. And basically what that is explaining is the beauty that God has created within this world is nonstop and continual. And even though creation doesn't literally speak to us, it communicates, doesn't it? Verse 3, you know, this is a little hard in Hebrew, uh, but essentially what it's saying is there is no um, speech nor are there words where the voice is not heard, meaning there's not an area of this world that has not seen the glory of God. Um, there's not a culture in this world that doesn't experience the impressiveness of El, of God in Hebrew, of the Creator. Everywhere, every day, every night, you and I swim in an ocean of the beauty of the impressive glory of God. It's all around us. And that's what verse 4 is saying. This message, you know, this word, you know, this revelation of God's impressiveness, it goes throughout all the earth in their words to the end of the world, meaning it expands everywhere. The whole globe sees the glory of God. And then, you know, I love how, you know, he takes it next because as much as he's taking sort of a global view of how creation testifies to a creator, uh, he then kind of focuses his attention on the sun. And you may be wondering, why is he so concerned about the sun? And he has kind of some funny descriptions of the sun. You know, he says, and God, he made a tent for the sun. <laughs> and you may be thinking, I don't really know what that is talking about. Well, friends, what I want to remind you of is in the ancient Near Eastern world, most people worship the sun, right? Ra right, the great Egyptian sun god, right? Most people saw the sun as sort of the deity itself. Uh, but the God of the Bible explains that, no, I'm the creator God. Um, I am not an object within the world. I am the creator of the world. I don't enter the world any more than Shakespeare enters Macbeth. I am above. I am the creator. I can't enter into a dialogue with Hamlet because I'm Shakespeare. I am the creator. I am not the creation. 
You are not to worship man-made things or worship the creation. You are to worship the creator. And so when he says God has set a tent, what he's saying is God has a home for the sun. (laughs) The sun doesn't control the world. God tells the sun what to do. And in ancient Near Eastern world, they would see the sun and it went to its home. It went to bed, right? (laughs) When the sun sets, I guess the sun went to bed, right? And that's what David is saying. The sun doesn't control things. God tells the sun when to rise and when to go to bed because God has created everything. And there's a chasm between the creator and creation. Don't worship the creation. See it as bearing the fingerprints of the creator, And then he goes on, and as he's thinking about the beauty of the world that you and I, as he's seeing God's world, the world around us, the physical world, his mind goes to all of these other beautiful things uh, that provoke wonder and excitement and joy. And the next thing he talks about is he thinks of the sun. He goes, yeah, you know what the sun reminds me of? It's like when a bridegroom leaves his chamber. All right, let me explain what that means as much as I can. A groom, after his wedding night, would leave his room kind of happy, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, it is Father's Day. So when you're driving home, maybe ask your parents what this is talking about. (laughs) But if you don't know why a groom would be leaping out of his bedroom the next morning, this is not the time to explain that to you. (laughs) Did you know the Bible is actually like PG-13 and above? Anyway. (laughs) You know, it, it was not written by white Victorian Europeans, right? Just in case you thought that. There's beauty in romantic, erotic love between a husband and his wife. There's beauty in the sun. There's beauty in creation. These are all things that reveal the fingerprints of a creator. And then he goes on and he says, this creation, it's, it's, like, it's like a strong man who runs his course with joy. You know, we would maybe say it this way. It's like a great athlete who's about to run the 100-meter dash at the Olympics. Ever trained and practiced and then put on your shin guards and then stood on the side of the soccer field before you went out to the game and just been so excited with your teammates? That sense of joy and wonder and excitement and passion? God says those are the fingerprints of a creative God who created this beautiful world. See, this... Glory of God goes throughout all the world. Look at verse 6. Creation, you know, the sun, the symbol of God's creative work, it goes to the ends of the world. And this glory of God, the reality of God, um, there's nothing that doesn't experience the heat of the warmth of God's truth in his world. Is it any wonder then, you know, why C.S. Lewis you know, the Oxford professor and the author of the Chronicles of Narnia and Mere Christianity, uh, he said this about Psalm 19. He said, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter in one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Now, of course, you know, when we think about how, you know, the world reveals kind of a creator, you know, this does sort of beg the question for many of us, though, that, well, when I see the world, I don't see a creator. What I see are sort of scientific processes, right? So when I, when I think about a guy getting excited after his wedding day, well, that really is a result sort of of our sexual urges, which is really the whole point of life, right, is to reproduce and survive, which is why we prefer attractive people and why we like, you know, attractive athletes because we see them as more uh, positive for reproductive, you know, needs and survival, right? So I, you know, if you've ever felt like that, um, I understand what you're, where you're coming from. Uh, But friends, what I want you to sort of consider uh, this morning, if that's where you are, is, is that actually the best explanation for the world around you? Uh, Because more and more, uh, even scientists are are struggling with how to explain the beauty and the order of creation in a way that uh, precludes a creator. Um, I mean, I'll I'll give you just some examples. in 1913, there was a scientist named Vesto Melvin Sliffler. Uh, he discovered, you know, famously, there were about a dozen galaxies moving away from Earth at a really high speed, right? And years later, there was an astronomer named Edwin Hubble, like the Hubble telescope was named after him. He carried this idea further and proved that as the stars were moving further and further away and the faster they were moving, 
he was actually able to figure out if you reverse engineer that, that means that there was a, a beginning moment in history. Right? We, we now know it as the Big Bang, right? When everything we know came into existence, right? Uh, but did you know that actually when these guys started advocating for this view, that most of the scientific community was repulsed by this idea? Uh, they seemed like it gave too much credence to the idea that there was a God who created things in a moment like Genesis 1 describes. Um, actually, uh, Philip Morrison, who was an MIT professor, after studying Hubble's work about the Big Bang, said this. He says, I would like to reject it because it seems to, pre to, to, to presume um, something that exists outside of, outside of time, space, and energy that could create these things. All right, so let me just kind of keep pushing on this idea just for a second. Um, there's a guy named Robert Jastra who founded the Goddard Institute for Space Studies at Columbia University. He works with NASA. Um, and he, he says it this way. This is a quote from him. He says, astronomers now find they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in the cosmos and on this earth. And they have found that this all happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to ever discover. That there are what I or anyone else would call supernatural forces at work, I now think is a scientifically proven fact. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance and he is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. That was Robert Jaster of the Goddard Center for Space Studies. Now, of course, we know that lots and lots of scientists um, cannot abide the idea that there is a creative God, uh, you know, that there is a creator behind everything. Uh, but friends, the more and more we study, the harder and harder it's becoming to explain the world around us without a creator. And I wish I could go more into it. We can talk about it more if you'd like. Uh, but let me just sort of catch you up to speed. Um, it is so hard to explain how our world is so perfectly orchestrated that the running um, philosophy now among theoretical physicists is that the best explanation we can have is that there, this must not be the only universe. There must be a multiverse. There must be an infinite number of universes because this one is just too dang perfect. Um, actually, um, <laughs> there's a guy named Alan Lightman. You may have heard of him. He, he, he wrote an article for Harper's Magazine in 2017 called Science's Crisis of Faith. And as a skeptical scientist, he basically goes on, he says, uh, he, I'll quote a pa at the end of his passage about this kind of crisis. What do we do? The world seems so designed. How are we supposed to explain this? He says, he quotes this. He says, but we have no conceivable way of observing if there are these other universes and we cannot prove their existence. Thus, to explain what we see in the world and in our mental deductions, we must believe in what we cannot prove. He says, if you, if you ignore a creator, you're left, we have to believe in a multiverse now, even though we know we will never be able to prove it. Uh, so friends, when you see the world, um, one explanation is sort of the reproductive urges drive everything and our survival urges drive everything and you know, we're just stardust after a big bang. Uh, but friends, if, if that were true, just, Think about this. Um, what in the world then is beauty? I mean, look at Psalm 1. What he's saying is, he's saying, if you have eyes to see, the whole cosmos has the fingerprints of God. And not only is it impressive, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. There's beauty in this world, not just in a sun rising, but, but in a man loving his wife, right? In, in an athlete running his race. There's beauty in that moment. So what in the world then is, how do you account for beauty? Now, it, I mean, of course, you could always say, you know, well, beauty is just us responding to survival and reproductive urges. Uh, but friends, is that, really, is that really what you think beauty is? <laughs> uh, because consider this, that, de that narrow definition that everything is either a sexual or a survival drive, that really doesn't explain um, many of the things that you would define as beautiful. I mean, just, you know, consider this. What reproductive quality does music have? 
What survival instinct does, does, does music provide or melody? Um, and notice that actually things that are beautiful um, often happen in sort of paradoxes, right? You can see something beautiful not in its you know, survival ability, but sometimes you can see beauty in something like a desert. Ever been driving down the road in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> Everything's a desert and you think it's so beautiful. Ever seen terrain after a hurricane and just thought, there's strange beauty to this. Have you ever seen a child show genuine love and friendship to an adult with Down syndrome? What reproductive or survival urge does that child have? And why do you respond so viscerally to it? You see, friends, how do you account for beauty in this world, and how do you account for the incredible design of the world? Uh, friends, the melody behind the clapping is this. We say it's God. It's God. It's the creator. Look at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. In Hebrew, that word right there for God is El. It's the same word we would use for God. That's the first step to the dance. But notice, starting in verse 7, at the second step, when we start to see God's truth we don't call him God, generic God. Instead, starting in verses 7 through 11, the name of God shifts. It's no longer generic creator. It shifts right there in verse 7. Look, it says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And if you look in your Bible, you'll notice something kind of interesting. Uh, you may have never noticed this before, but the name Lord right there, if you look closely, is actually in all capitalized letters. The law of the Lord. It's, you're not supposed to shout it. That's not like, it's not putting it in bold, right? the law of the Lord. That's not what it's saying. Lord right there is meant to cue you as a reader to know that the word right there is not really Lord. The word is Yahweh, the divine personal name of the creator. So step one is we see God's world. Step two is we see God's truth. And by God's truth, I mean his word how he reveals himself to us in the person of Yahweh. Now, you get close to saying Yahweh like all of the time when you say hallelujah, hallelujah. That's actually what you're saying when you say hallelujah. Now, what's the third commandment? Anybody know what the third commandment is? You shall not take the name of the Lord. In you don't want to say God's divine name in an inappropriate way. So you know what the Israelites did? They just never said the name Yahweh. And if they wanted to say, praise Yahweh, hallelujah, Yahweh, what did they do? Hallelujah. Ha, ah, I didn't say Yahweh, didn't take the third commandment inappropriately, didn't break the commandment. One way you avoid the third commandment is you just never say Yahweh. Which is why today uh, we, we struggle sometimes to know exactly how would they have pronounced Yahweh. Did they say Yahweh? And sometimes we think they'll say Jehovah. But that's not what they said. But sometimes you'll see in the Bible say Jehovah because it's trying to explain how do you pronounce the name that is inexpressible? God in his person, his personality, his uniqueness, not just God as the creator, but the God of the Bible. I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am that I am. I am Yahweh. This is the second step is you have to see God as revealed through his word his uniqueness. And look at all of the promises that this passage gives. Look at 7 through 11. It says, the law, the Torah, the instruction of Yahweh is perfect. It revives the soul. When Hebrew people would, um, you know, they get close to death, they would see that as they were dying and then as they passed away, they would say their soul left their body. So to be revived in your soul was right to come back from almost being dead, right? And you see, what the Bible is explaining to you is knowing that God exists is not enough to have life in this world. You can acknowledge that there is a God creator, but profoundly what you need to know to live in the world that God created is you need to know the creator as Yahweh himself. And if you do, all of his ways are perfect. And what you'll experience is life itself. Your life will be restored. You will be revived and refreshed 
And then he goes on, he says, God's testimony is sure. It makes wise the simple. Right? It's, you know, the way we're supposed to live is not immediately clear to us. Is it immediately clear to you that you're supposed to care for people who are weaker than you? That when you work, you're supposed to work for the glory of God and not your own pride? These things are not immediately clear to us. So this is where we need God to reveal his will for us, and that's what happens through his instruction. Right? It makes us wise. It gives us new life. And look at verse 8. It says God's precepts is just another way of saying his rules or his, his law, the way that he, he commands us to live. They're right, rejoicing the heart. And I know that's such a crazy idea for us in America to think that rules could lead to rejoicing. You know, we think of freedom only in terms of freedom from, not freedom to. Right? So rules always are bad. Right? Rules, bad. Ooh, you're a rule person. Bad. bad very bad. But friends, if you've ever broken the rules and been brought back, you know what's kind of funny? You see the rules a whole lot differently. This is like 98% of your parenting philosophy, okay? I broke the rules and I suffered. Ergo, I don't want you to break the rules because why? I don't want you to suffer. I'll give you, I'll give you just kind of an example from my own life of how I've rejoiced recently um, in following the rules. All right, so... Um, Two days ago, my lovely wife and our three little kids left for a road trip to Salt Lake City uh, to visit family. And uh, my wife is so great, she didn't take my advice. I advised her to drive through Nevada. She said, nah, I'm gonna drive through Idaho. Well, seven hours into that 13 hour road trip, guess what? Our car broke down for the first time ever on the side of the interstate. It literally died on the side of the road. And so she called me and she said, do we have roadside assistance. And I thought, uh. <laughs> I pulled out the Geico app, and we did. <laughs> and ironically, for the first time ever, when we bought that used car, you ever get those like gut instincts? They were like, you want to buy the platinum warranty? And I was like, no. <laughs> well, tell me about it. I bought the platinum warranty because that would be the prudent thing to do. And guess what? Like the $1,400 repair was all covered by our warranty. And we got the Geico Road Assistance and they brought Caroline and the kids where they needed to go. Now, the reason I'm giving that example is not because you need to follow my example, but merely because there is a sense, friend, when you follow the rules and do what's right. Man, you can actually rejoice and be thankful and excited. And so, actually, the conversation between me and Caroline was like, well, honey, well, you're actually kind of an okay husband. And I was like, yeah, I kind of am. <laughs> See, friends, if you've ever broken it and been brought back, uh, C.S. Lewis has this great illustration. He says, the only person that can love the path is the person who lost themselves in the swamp and crawling back has found his way again. Friends, the precepts, the instruction of the Lord, they're all right. They give light to our eyes. They endure forever. They are righteous altogether. Um, they, look at verse 10. They're, it's more desired to be a righteous person, to love the Lord, to follow his word, than it is to even be rich. It's better than any sweet thing you could ever possibly eat. Remember about six years ago, I went into this multi-millionaire's house. Um, he's a public figure, so I can't say who it is, uh, but he's famous. And uh, I went into his home, and it was the biggest house I've ever been in, um, even to this day. It was very, very impressive. You know, it had the gate, had the had all the bricks in the world, you know, it's a huge house. And um, you know what struck me when I was walking around his house? Um, I knew that he and his wife were getting a divorce, and I knew what it was, what it was doing to his teenagers. And you know, I'm looking around, I'm looking at all these family photos, right? I'm looking at this massive house. It was like, this would have been the foyer, right? And at the time, I was in seminary, and there's no broke like seminary broke. You know, we lived in a house without a backyard. And I just remember going home and being like, you, I wouldn't trade lives with you in an instant. Give me my tiny little house and my happy family over your massive home and your heartbreak any day. I mean, that's what, the, that's what the Psalms is saying. God's word, his truth, 
will bless your life and you'll enjoy it any more than you will possibly if you break his ways and pursue things. I mean, who wouldn't trade that? His words, his ways are so precious. It's better than any gold, even the best gold you can think of, even the best house you could imagine, the best vacations. No matter what, loving the Lord and following his ways will always, always, always be better. First step is to see God's world and his fingerprints all over it. The second step to the dance is seeing God's truth and his word and trusting that it will lead you to have the blessed life. The third and final step is seeing God's grace. Look at verses 12 through 14. You know, if, we, if you see the creator God and you know you're supposed to follow his ways, uh, friends, if you actually see those two things in full honesty, there is a creator God who is profoundly more than I have ever imagined him. He is not um, existing within the world. He exists in the world like Shakespeare has created Hamlet. <laughs> he exists outside of space, time, matter. And he has created all things for his glory. And he compels me, he commands me to live in accord with his personality, loving the things that he loves, hating the things that he hates, rejoicing in righteousness. Friends, if you see those two things in truth, uh, there's only really one thing you can respond with, which is profound humility, even guilt. Because you know the holiness of God and you know his righteous standard. And who are we to stand before our maker. I mean, this is the consistent pattern throughout all of the Bible. When people actually see God for who they are, what do they say? Depart from me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Who am I to stand before the Lord Almighty? And that's exactly what David does. Look at verse 12. As he contemplates these two things, he says, who, How can I stand before this righteous God? How can I follow all of your ways? I know they're right, but who am I to follow them? Who can discern his errors? He says, God, declare me innocent for my hidden faults. There are things about me that I don't even know yet. And then verse 13, he says, keep me from presumptuous or willful sins. I know I don't just sin in hidden ways. I sin in willful ways. God, I don't want to live like that. Don't let these have dominion over me. You see, what David is crying out for is grace. He's saying, I acknowledge your truth, I acknowledge you're the creator, but I need to be made right with you. I need you to forgive me. I don't want to keep sinning. I need to be reconciled to you. I, my life is forfeit. <laughs> I have gone down the wrong path. I have not done the right thing, and I need you to redeem my life. I need you to protect me, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. But friends, how can we be innocent again? You know, how can we live in a world longing for beauty and live in a land of unclean lips? Well, friends, this is why you need God's word. Because in the story that God has given you, the Bible that's in your lap, what God explains is David, King David, was really foreshadowing the ultimate son of David. You see, God had promised long ago that he would take a people group, the Israelites, the children of Abraham, and he would use their physical lineage to one day bless the entire world. And then he says, and one of those Israelites will be the descendant of King David. But even though King David died, this king, he's going to reign forever. And all of the nations, tribes, tongues, and people groups of this world will bring him tribute and bow down to him. And the New Testament begins like this. This is the story of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. You see, this whole passage is pointing us to Jesus, who is not only God, but is the word made flesh. Go to John chapter 1. We'll finish up with this. If you go to John chapter 1, John is going to explain God's world. He is going to explain God's word. And he's going to show us God's grace. He's going to start dancing. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But do you hear it? 
you hear it. Hear what God tells us. John chapter 1. This is the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into where? God's world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. You see, friends, profoundly in the song that God is writing, in the rhythms of this world, God's world is actually the world that Jesus has created for his own glory. God's word became a man. God's message, his truth, his personality, his uniqueness became a man, and his name was Jesus Christ, who was God. And friends, if that's hard to believe, um, you know, that God could enter our world as a man. Um, if he's God, why would he not be able to do that? And if he were loving, why would he not enter our world to save it? And lastly, the God-man, Jesus, offers God's grace. What do you have to do? Look at verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Friends, God's grace was revealed in Jesus, full of grace and truth. Um, you can't save yourself from your willful sins, but you know who can? Jesus. Uh, friends, that's an invitation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your truth and your word. And Lord, we thank you that those two things are revealed and met in Jesus Christ, uh, who loved us and gave himself for us. Uh, Lord, as we see this world that you have created, Father, would we see your fingerprints? Uh, Lord, would we see that you uh, created this world so that we would praise the impressive glory that you have? And Father, as we see things like athletes running and people falling in love and the beauty of the mountains, uh, Father, would we give all the glory to you? Father, would we trust your word that Jesus always leads us in your truth? And Father, would we trust his grace? Amen.